Welcome to the CTSNet Roundtable Discussion. My name is Tom Nguyen. I'm an adult cardiothoracic surgeon in Houston, Texas, and we're here at the SCS in Phoenix, Arizona. Within the past six or seven years, there's been an explosion in technology in the way we treat aortic stenosis, and it's pretty clear that the way we treat aortic stenosis in the past is very different than the way we treat aortic stenosis in the present and in the future. I have the privilege of being here with a distinguished group of panelists with very unique backgrounds. And our goal today is to provide some light into the future of aortic stenosis with specific emphasis on minimally invasive valve surgery, transcatheter aortic valve surgery, as well as standard traditional stenotomy. Let's first start with our panelists. panelists. Could each of you provide a brief description as well as your most common approach for treating a patient with aortic stenosis and why? We'll start with Dr. Chen. So my name is Edward Chen. I'm the faculty at Emory University, um, and I t typically treat aortic with a standard stenotomy incision, although uh, for several years I, I did several mini-invasive approaches, but have gone back to the stenotomy reasons for stenotomy incision for a number of different reasons. Dr. Lamellis. My name is Dr. Joseph Lamellis. I'm the chief of cardiac surgery at Mount Sinai in Miami Beach, and my preferred technique is a mini right mini thoracotomy, minimally invasive aortic valve replacement. And this is my exclusive technique for aortic valve surgery. I'm Dr. Kendra Grubb. I'm Dr. Kendra Grubb from the University of Louisville. And I have the opportunity to use all of these techniques. And in addition to traditional open uh, aortic valve replacement and using a mini sternotomy, I also use a transcatheter approach where we don't open the chest at all and go through the groin, use the anatomy going backwards, and put a valve inside the patient's valve without ever opening the chest and without even putting the patient to sleep. Dr. Chen, in, in all the studies we look at, we always see the traditional stenotomy as a gold standard. Why is stenotomy the gold standard? I think it's the approach that's had the longest track record. It's uh, an op operation that can be done in any cardiac surgery OR. Uh, in the world. I think there's certainly plenty of literature to support the, um, the low operative risk and longevity of that operation. So I think it, uh, and you know, we as surgeons have a very high standard for surgical results. Uh, so I think uh, it is still probably the benchmark to which these new therapies should be measured. What well, Dr. Mullis does almost all his uh, aortic valve replacements through a right uh, mini thoracotomy. Dr. Moss, will the minimally invasive right thoracotomy ever be the gold standard? And what are some of the advantages of minimally invasive uh, aortic valve replacement? Right, so there's no doubt that I think that all young surgeons should consider a sternotomy the gold standard because I think you need to get familiar with the anatomy, the surgical techniques. But if a mini thoracotomy approach is truly a lesser invasive procedure, which I truly think so, and the results are better long term, both intraoperatively and postoperatively, I think that any new technology should be based or should be compared to the mini thoracotomy approach. And we hear the term mini thoracotomy or uh, minimally invasive aortic valve replacement all the time, but, but it can vary between an upper hemisternotomy, a parasternal incision, a right thoracotomy. How do you define minimally invasive aortic valve replacement? Well, in my early years in, in minimally invasive surgery, I went through the whole evolution of upper sternotomy, even lower sternotomy transverse sternotomy, parasternal. So I've explored all the different options, but after seeing the, the, the benefits of a true right mini thoracotomy, I think there's no doubt that this is the, the only way to consider uh, a minimally invasive operation is to do it through a mini thoracotomy approach. Because if you're gonna do an upper hemisternotomy, I feel you just might as well take the rest of the sternum and complete it. Right, and, and Dr. Kendra Grubb does most of her aortic valve replacements through a transcatheter uh, valve approach. Will sternotomy always be the gold standard, or is TAVRIC taking over? That's what I hear from our cardiologists out there. Well, I think at the current time, uh, the gold standard continues to be sternotomy. And for the same reasons that Dr. Lamellis brought up, every cardiac surgeon should be uh, able to do a traditional open aortic valve replacement. Going forward, trials will allow us to answer that question. Um, and certainly the early data coming out of the intermediate risk trials looks like there's potential for transcatheter aortic valve replacement to be similar, if not better, than traditional sternotomy, and the low risk trials should be starting soon. So I think that we'll know the specific answer to that a few years from now. 
and we're doing uh, more and more TAVRs uh, for the oryx stenosis. Dr. Chen and Dr. Lamellas, how has TAVR affected your open surgical, surgical AV, AVR volumes? For, for me, it actually has not. Um, you know, one of my primary focus at Emory is aortic surgery and complex cardiac surgery. So what I've noticed is that the, the patients that I operate on for aortic stenosis come who have anatomy that's inadequate for TAVR or have some sort of um, risk factor where the, those minimally invasive approaches are not appropriate. One thing we have noticed is that the amount of redo AVRs that we've done has actually gone, after previous coronary bypass has gone down, but we've done redo AVRs in other clinical settings where transcatheter therapy was just not appropriate. So it hasn't really affected me to, at all, to be honest. Dr. Lamellis. Yes, it hasn't affected my volume either. I think that there's no doubt that both techniques are complementary as opposed to competitive. And as Dr. Chen mentioned, there's a, this very complex cardiac ana uh, anatomy that, or in pathology that cannot be addressed through a transcatheter approach, even double valve pathology and triple valve pathology, which definitely need other surgical approaches. Right. A very controversial topic now are, are patients who are low risk and intermediate. Um, I'm very curious to hear Dr. Grubb's comments, but Dr. Chen and Dr. Lamellis, what's a role for TAVR in patients who are low risk and intermediate? And then I'll follow up with Dr. Grubb's uh, uh, feeling on that. You know, I think it's difficult to say right now. I think it should be studied um, because we don't have the answer based on uh, evidence-based um, data. So I, I'm, it's hard for me to predict what that's gonna be like for a low risk patient. Um, certainly in an intermediate risk patient, some of that data is forthcoming, but I'm very curious as to what that is going to be, turn out to be like because I think it's important to know these things. Dr. Lamellis. Yeah, there's no doubt that, as mentioned, we don't have sufficient studies to demonstrate which technique will be better than, than the other, but now the golden standard, if you may, is a traditional aortic valve replacement. And in addition to that, we're not sure if doing a TAVR in a low risk patient if they need a redo operation in the future, will it become a technically more challenging operation? So maybe a surgical replacement initially, and then maybe a TAVR as a second operation may be the way I would look at it. Dr. Grubb, so what are the studies out there that support TAVR for low risk and intermediate patients? Well, currently in the U.S., both the Edwards valve, the Sapien 3, as well as the Medtronic valve, the Evolute R, are undergoing intermediate risk trials. And that data is um, compelling in the short term. We still do not know durability and the long-term results, and so both physicians here bring up excellent points. Um, you know, just anecdotally from my own practice, however, even my high-risk patients were able to complete this operation awake. The patient goes home the very next morning. And in traditional heart surgery, they're usually spending four days in the hospital. Certainly, they're under general anesthesia. And it's just a different experience. So the answer uh, to what is better, you know, we'll find out in the next few years. But in terms of what we can offer, certainly from a patient standpoint, I would say that the experience for TAVR is, is compelling. It's much better than traditional open surgery and possibly even a lower risk, possibly lower uh, length of stay compared to what Dr. Lomelis offers. Right now we're talking about a 1% to 2% ri risk of mortality and less than 1% risk of stroke for TAVR in high-risk patients. How did you learn how to do TAVRs? And on the Corley, I know that you're at an academic center. How do you teach TAVRs to your residents and fellows? Well, I decided to take an additional year of training after I finished my thoracic surgery training and went to Columbia University and did a dedicated year of interventional cardiology and transcatheter therapies to be able to learn the techniques, learn the wire skills, learn the imaging required. I think it's a challenge to train thoracic surgery fellows in this because there are so many things that they need to learn. And as we've described, the gold standard is still open surgery. So their foundation still needs to be open surgery. Our fellows do come and spend designated time with us in the hybrid OR trying to learn these techniques. But I think in the current stage, they really need to be doing like a super fellowship and spending a dedicated year to really get these skills. And Dr. Lamellis, the minimally invasive aortic valve replacement through a right thoracotomy is, is uh, some would argue, technically challenging. How did you learn how to do minimally invasive aortic valve replacement, and how do you teach others how to do minimally invasive aortic valve replacements? Well, when I started 
doing the minimally invasive cases many years ago because I thought that there, was, there has to be a different way to approach the aortic valve. And also, I wanted to differentiate myself from a standard uh, sternotomy surgeon. So I embarked in, in trying to learn it from watching the, the group at NYU initially. And then as the years evolved, my technique evolved, and I tried to make it as simple as possible and as reproducible so other surgeons could, could, uh, can do it as well. And how do you teach others to, to, to learn this technique that you've, uh, right. you've mastered? Well, I think the surgeon needs to learn first, as I mentioned earlier, the sternotomy approach, but I, it, it's really a lot easier taught in residency programs as opposed to what I'm doing now where surgeons come to watch me because they really don't get that hands-on experience. So I think it should start in the academic centers and, and then the, the young surgeons will be able to teach the others moving forward. So we talk about residency and training, and clearly each of you do uh, aortic valve replacements in a very different fashion. Should it be required for fellows to graduate uh, an ACGM requirement to be able to do minimally invasive valve replacement and transcatheter aortic valve replacement? I think it's very difficult to, to put that strict requirement on surgeons. Some of it has to be your own will. But it seems like the design. future's heading in that direction. No, it sounds like from you, know, from you and Dr. Grubb that, that you know, in the future we're going to probably do a lot of aortic valve replacements to the minimally invasive approach or transcatheter. Again, I think it's, gonna, it's difficult to make it a requirement, but I, I definitely think if, if you want to stay in the game, if you will, you, you really need to, to move forward and, and advance your own techniques, whether it's transcatheter or minimally invasive. Dr. Grubb, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's hard because not every thoracic surgery resident is going to do aortic valve surgery. Um, you will have some that do strictly thoracic, and so to make that a requirement seems, at this point, the way that we have one kind of track, um, it's, it seems challenging. Also, if you were going to be a heart failure VAD transplant surgeon, those wire skills may not be applicable to your career. That being said, of course, I'm biased, and all of our fellows spend some time with us in the hybrid OR. My understanding, Dr. Lamellis and Dr. Chen, uh, that, that you, uh, you two don't specifically do towers at your institution, what would convince you or make you em embrace TAVR and be actively involved with transcatheter technology? What would be the, the kind of swing the pendulum for you to, to go out there in the cath lab and get some lead on and, and do some TAVRs? Well, I think that uh, for me, I'd, I'd have to have a change in career. Uh, I do complex surgery and, and simply um, cannot do focus on you know, high risk aortic procedures uh, and transcatheter valve therapy because these are very distinctly different areas and TAVR is something that requires a lot of expertise and I think it has a very important role but I think for it to survive and do well and for surgeons to be involved I think we need to have real experts uh, such as Dr. Grubb to, to sort of take the lead on that so I think it's important to focus on something and do it well as opposed to being a jack, jack of all trades. What are your thoughts Dr. Lamellis? Well, I, I started the TAVR program in our hospital and I did the first 30 cases. And after realizing that, that I can't be a jack of all trades, I thought that my time was better spent in the operating room with the surgical techniques and more advanced uh, uh, surgical pathology and treating more difficult cases that require surgical, a surgical approach. But there's no doubt that, that I think the surgeon does have to be involved with uh, transcatheter technology as well. We can't let that go from, from our domain and just hand it over to the cardiologist 100%. As we conclude, I, I wanted to get the panelists' thoughts on the future of aortic valve surgery, and uh, I'd like to do an informal poll. 20 years from now, are most aortic valve replacements gonna be done by traditional sternotomy through a minimally invasive approach or transcatheter, Dr. Chen? I think it'll mostly be done transcatheter. I think traditional sternotomy will still have some role. It's unclear to me what that role will be because I don't think we have enough evidence um, based on these trials that are forthcoming to know what the ultimate outcome and long-term outcomes will be. Minimally invasive surgery should have a role, but uh, I think that the traditional operations probably will be done in very complex patients where there are no other options. Dr. Lamellis. Uh, there's no doubt that the way it looks right now that 20 years from now, we transcatheter technologies may dominate the field but again, I don't think that, that surgery is going to be obsolete. I think we'll still, the surgeon will have a definite, uh, strong role in, in aortic valve surgery. And Dr. Grubb. I have to agree with uh, both the gentlemen. I think that transcatheter therapies will be a predominant 
uh, way that we fix aortic stenosis, but the question still becomes durability. And if we talk about traditional surgical valves lasting 10-ish years, if you're talking about younger patients, there has to be a strategy where you start with one platform and are able to build on that. So maybe the first is a minimally invasive aortic valve replacement, and then after, if that valve wears out in 10 to 15 years, then you start the transcatheter therapies. We don't know the answer to that because we don't have the answer to the durability question, but I think ultimately transcatheter therapies are here to stay. Well, as we close, I wanted to thank the panelists for a very productive discussion this morning, and it's our hope that the audience uh, felt that the discussion was informative and valuable. Thank you. Thank you.